just a minute to join this call. All right, good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar on Nettles Critical Mineral Sustainability Program. My name is Katherine Klein and I'm a technical advisor at New York Center for Partnerships and Innovation, where I support the coal modernization and carbon management partnership between the US Department of Energy and New York. Before we get started, I'd like to introduce today's moderator, Chairman Charlotte Lane. Chair Lane was appointed to the Public Service Commission of West Virginia on July 1st, 2019. She previously served on the commission from 1985 to 1989 and from 1997 until 2003. In addition to her work on the commission, Chair Lane was elected to three terms in the West Virginia House of Delegates. She was also appointed to serve on the U.S. International Trade Commission from 2003 to 2011 by President George W. Bush. Chair Lane has practiced law in state and federal courts in West Virginia for many years and has been admitted to practice in the Third and Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals and the Supreme Court of the United States. Chairman Lanes has served as president of the West Virginia Bar Association, the Mid-Atlantic Conference of Regulatory Utility Commissioners, and the Charleston Rotary Club. She has also served on the board of directors of the Rotary Foundation of Washington, D.C., the National Association of Regulatory Utility Commissioners, NARUC, the Charleston Chamber of Commerce, the Board of Governors of the West Virginia State Bar, and as a member of the West Virginia University College of Law Visiting Committee. Chairman Lane graduated from Marshall University with a Bachelor of Arts in Journalism and Political Science, and she received her Doctorate of Jurisprudence from the West Virginia University College of Law. With that, I will pass it over to you, Chair Lane. Thank you for joining us today. Well, thank you for joining the NARUP Subcommittee on Clean Coal and Carbon Management for today's briefing seminar, Nettles Critical Mineral, Mineral Sustainability Program. Today's webinar is possible due to support from the U.S. Department of Energy, NARUP Coal Modernization and Carbon Management Partnership. I'm pleased to welcome everyone to today's presentation. Today, our panel features Jessica Mullen, Technology Manager, Rare Earth Elements and Critical Mem Minerals, National Energy Technology Laboratory. Paul Zimkovich, I hope I got that right, a PhD Director, Water Research Institute, and Aaron Noble, Associate Director, Center for Advanced Separation Technologies, Virginia Tech. Today's webinar will be recorded with the recordings and slides posted on NARUC's website and emailed to attendees next week. Please enter questions into the Q&A box and we will get through as many as possible following the presentations. I'd like now to introduce our three panelists today in order of presentation. First, we have Jessica Mullen. She is a technology manager of DOE's National Energy Technology Laboratory in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Dr. Mullen lends her scientific expertise and le le leadership to manage the Critical Minerals and Materials Program. In this role since 2021, Dr. Mullen oversees CMM program execution, which entails a robust research, design development, and demonstration portfolio of projects built around feedstocks sourced from unconventional and secondary materials and with the goal of creating an environmentally benign, economically viable, just, technically feasible, stable, and secure domestic critical mineral supply chain necessary for the clean energy transition. Next, we have Paul Zimkovich, Director of the Water Research Institute. He's a native of Pittsburgh with a PhD from the University of British Columbia and an MS and BS from Utah State University. He worked for 10 years with the Alberta Department of Energy before coming to West Virginia University to serve as director of the Water Research Institute. The Institute develops and carries out environmental research projects in the region and nationally. 
Research focus areas include management and treatment of waste streams from coal mining and oil and gas development. Major programs include coal mine reclamation, water treatment, and watershed restoration and brownfields development. And finally, we have Aaron Noble. He is a professor and incoming department head in the Department of Mining and Minerals Engineering at Virginia Tech. His instruction and research are in the general areas of mineral processing, process economics, and critical mineral production. Aaron has a BS, an MS, and a PhD, all from Virginia Tech and all in mining and mining engineering, and he is a licensed professional engineer in the Commonwealth of Virginia. So first we will have Jessica. Thank you. Thank you very much, Commissioner Lane. Good afternoon. Um, it is a, a pleasure to have been invited to participate in this webinar. Um, first, I want to thank the, 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 the Commissioner Lane for the wonderful introduction. And um, just let you know, there are a lot more slides than I'm gonna have time to go through. Do not be scared off by the number of words. Um, it is hard being a technology manager and trying to convey what you want in pictures only. So feel free to ignore the words and look at the pictures. So we have a challenge in our country right now. And for anyone who was around during the pandemic, you heard about supply chain shortages, you heard about chip shortages, and um, you've heard about the transition to the energy economy. And all of these depend on rare earth elements, which are a subset of critical minerals. Um, right now, there is a dominant player in the world for the production of rare earths, which is a misnomer because they are not technically rare. They're just found in smaller concentrations. Uh, and so they're spread out throughout the, the earth's crest. Um, and what we're trying to do here at NETL is we're trying to fill in that gap. We're trying to overcome this challenge and provide a sustainable supply of critical minerals for domestic usage, for the energy economy, for powering the products of today, as President Biden said in his speech back in 2022, stating that critical minerals and having a, a, a domestic supply is a national priority. So in order to understand what we're trying to go after in our program, we need to explain what critical minerals and rare earth elements are. So critical minerals are a subset of the periodic table um, defined as a non-fuel mineral or a mineral material that is essential to the economics or national security of the United States. Rare earth elements are a subset of those critical minerals. Um, there are 50 approximately critical minerals that are listed uh, on the periodic table and 17 of them are considered rare earth elements. Um, a nice helpful indicator, if you wanna go back to your high school chemistry class, um, this is a the periodic table of elements. The blue, um, the blue boxes are what we refer to as rare earth elements. They are also part of the critical minerals which are also listed in gray. And then we have a vertical green bar to indicate um, that these are considered especially important for the clean energy transition. So critical minerals and rare earths are used in everyday objects. You cannot function as a, as a citizen of today's first world um, nation and, and actually many third world nations without having critical minerals a part of your, your daily life. Um, the, the part that most people are going to recognize is their cell phones. Um, whenever you get a phone call, whenever you get a text message, when your phone vibrates, it is a rare earth magnet that is causing that phone to vibrate. It is in touch screens there and um, 
the wind turbines and electric vehicles, both in their batteries and in the motors and a multitude of other things. You, we cannot function as an economy without having rare earth and critical minerals. The, what makes our program unique here at NETL is we're sourcing them instead of from a mine, instead of as a primary source material, um, we are sourcing them from secondary and unconventional feedstocks. And, and our, our purpose when our program started was using coal and coal byproducts as that feedstock. And what we've determined over the years is that it's not just in the coal itself, it's in this, this, the material that's above it, it's in the material that's below it. It's in the water that comes up when um, oil and gas drilling operations. It's in byproducts of um, municipal solid waste and when, when phosphorus is being removed down in Florida. Um, and as Paul will go into in his talk, the, it's an acid mine drainage that is a, a byproduct of the coal mining operations. It's in the refuse materials, it's in the ash um, that is a residual when coal is burned in a power plant. So there's many of these different sources and people don't traditionally think of those as being sources of rare earth elements. Normally you would think of a mine, but there really isn't the geography in the United States that there is in, in several other countries to provide these um, primary mine feedstocks. And so our program here at NETL is to, to try and harvest and create a sustainable supply chain from these primary or from these secondary and unconventional feedstocks. And as a bonus benefit, many of these feedstocks are considered environmental burdens or, or waste products. So we get the benefit of not only providing a domestic supply for, for something that the United States desperately needs for the energy economy and for national security, but we also get the benefit of cleaning up the environment, cleaning up the legacy um, that, that has resulted from our past fossil energy production. So it's a, it's a nice win-win situation there. So as was indicated previously, um, the world supply is dominated by, by one country and a monopoly like that is hard to stomach. Um, it's hard to have a secure future when, when a government controlled uh, country decides that maybe they want to adjust the price of a material and make it so that everyone else is priced out of the market. And so we wanna have this resilient um, economy here. And, and at one point the US was top and the US was the, the, the leading manufacturer and supplier for the world's needs. Um, however, the US didn't have the foresight and was looking for cheaper and, and easier and, and offshore it um, and now we're trying to bring that, that production back on, on shore. Um, in order to grow the, the supply chain, there's several key steps along the way. The first step is we have to extract, extract it from the original uh, feedstock material. Then we need to separate it from the feedstock material and separate it from each other um, because there are, are different elements that are contained in that, in that what we call a mixed rare earth oxide or a mixed rare earth salt. And then we have to purify it and refine it. And then finally, we have um, production and, and make products afterwards. So just as an example, given in this diagram on the right, this is just for centered neodymium iron boron, boron magnets. Um, what's represented by green is China's, China's influence on that particular step of the, of the supply chain. And you can see at this initial circle for extraction, there are, are other countries that have um, critical mineral and, and rare earth feedstocks. But as we start going up to the more complex portions of the process, you can see that the, the amount of players in the game is small and it's completely dominated by China. And this is what we're trying to um, adjust here in the US. So to give you an example, uh, using a reverse engineering analogy to help you understand and, and put it into 
um, words that you could understand without having to go through the, the complex technical terms. Imagine a sprinkle cake. Um, everybody knows what that is. You have this cake at the, the uh, on your, your graphic here. Um, you have the different colored sprinkles. And in this analogy, the different colored sprinkles are the rare earths themselves. So what we're trying to do is take the cake, which would be the earth or whatever the primary feedstock is that we're using as our, our resource material. And we wanna take out the rare earths, which is actually the colored part of the sprinkles themselves. So the first step of the extraction process is you gotta get those sprinkles out. And then you wanna separate them into their different colors, uh, which is analogous to separating out the different rare earths into um, parts by parts. Then you wanna purify and refine that. And in our analogy here, that would be taking the food coloring out of the uh, sprinkles themselves. And then as the final step, you would make a new product with it. In this instance, you'd have the blue paint or you would have the, uh, the rubber ducky that uses the yellow. And we want this entire process to be happening here in the United States from the feedstocks that we have um, available domestically. So jumping into what our program here at NETL is focused on, our mission is to develop an economic, competitive and sustainable domestic supply chain for the energy transition, which provides for economic and national security. We have multiple different objectives, um, the primary, as I said before, is these is recovery using the unconventional and secondary resources. Um, we are doing that through technology development and through regional assessment and production of uh, critical minerals, as well as non-fuel based carbon based products and other value added products to help create an overall economic system that allows for the recovery efforts from these types of feedstocks. The drivers and the challenges are the overshore dominance. I mean, you could see from that circle example that I have there, the US is just a tiny, tiny player in that game. And we're trying to increase um, our, our, our footprint in that, in that game. Um, we also know that the market is very volatile and the prices can fluctuate quite dramatically or be falsely manipulated um, in order to try and bankrupt some of the new players into the market. And we know that the rare earth, con the rare earth content in these heterogeneous um, unconventional resources is, is not standard and it needs the new technology to try and make it more economic. And I don't expect everyone to be able to read this particular graphic. The purpose here, given time, um, increasing in the, the lower graph as we're headed to the right and technology, technology complexity increasing as you go up according to the left axis. Um, what I want to really emphasize here is not that we put out these funding solicitations. It's the fact that we have started our program back in 2015 as a just a feasibility is it even possible let's let's do some basic field prospecting let's see if it's even if it's even feasible and here we are nearly 10 years later and we have just we we're recently um, selected and are in the process of awarding awards so that we can build a demonstration facility um, it's just really unfathomable to think about the, the progress that this program has come through in, in less than 10 years. And, and Aaron and the, my, my other co-speakers here, Aaron and, and Paul themselves have been critical along, along the route they've received um, them and their organizations along with others have received funding that we have provided for research and development. And, you know, this program stands on the shoulders of those who are able to do the research. And Paul and Aaron are two of the really good ones that are, that are making great successes and inroads in this and, and helping us move this program forward. What I wanna emphasize here, so um, FOA stands for Funding Opportunity Announcement. 
TRL stands for Technology Readiness Level and RFP stands for Request for Proposals. So the technology readiness level is just as that number increases, it goes from increasing complexity from down here at a, at a lower TRL, it's a, like a lab scale. Um, so you're doing it inside a laboratory. And by the time you get up to a TRL of 789, you have demonstration facility, you're virtually on the way to commercial. And we have these different funding opportunity announcements and NETL is unique in its laboratory status in that we're a go-go. So we're a government owned, government operated laboratory, which means we're allowed to provide funding that's given to, con given to us by Congress to advance these research programs forward. And you can see over here, and I, and I will note there's asterisks. Um, then this right, right column here, we have multiple funding opportunity announcements planned in the coming um, months to, to, to the next year. So for anyone who might be interested in soliciting for federal dollars, keep your eyes aware of that. Um, I'm, so here's where I'm gonna start going really quickly through the slides and these will be made available for you to refer to afterwards if you want to dig into it and you can always email me afterwards too if you want more information than what I've provided here. Um, so our biggest, our biggest um, item at the moment is this demonstration scale facility. This money was provided through the bipartisan infrastructure law and was one of the major initiatives that we put out here in the last uh, calendar year. We are, designing and developing a first of a kind facility that will extract and separate critical minerals and rare earth elements from acid mine drainage, mine waste, or other deleterious materials. It must be economic, competitive, and provide for the domestic supply chain, as well as pursuing environmental and economic justice. What we want along with creating this domestic supply chain is to um, help um, alleviate some of the environmental and economic burden on um, fossil communities. And so the, the hope is that when this demonstration facility is built, that it will um, provide jobs to those in the local region. And Paul will go into it a little bit more during his talk um, because he is one of, he is a participant in one of the two projects that was selected as a negotiation for award. And then the other that was selected was the University of North Dakota. And these are in negotiations right now and we hope to have the awards in place by the end of July. We also had a notice of intent that went out in October for an upcoming um, funding opportunity that will help that is very similar to those two that I just mentioned. Um, we have another funding opportunity that has been announced that we have planned to come out here very soon. That's gonna continue next generation of development because now we've got that first generation of conventional technologies and we're gonna build it up to a demonstration scale. But in order to continually push and to continually try and get to that economic stage, we need to be developing new technologies as well. And so this, this funding opportunity is, is looking to, um, to that goal of a ne the next generation of technology development and refining, um, bringing that back to the US and creating that. We have an initiative called CORE-CM, which stands for Carbon Ore, Rare Earth and Critical Minerals Initiative for US basins. This is currently in its phase one and it has 13 projects across the country. All of them have the same tasks and the same goals, just focused on their individual regions. Um, those individual tasks are listed down here in the bottom box. And the, um, we've had some major accomplishments that have happened throughout that initiative as well. Um, it's not a technology development, it's more of a characterization effort at this stage, but we're really excited with the, the success that we're having there. It's, it's trying to incorporate um, state, local, federal, um, industry, tribal governments, 
we really want a consortium type team in each of these different basins in order to look at the different um, feedstock materials that contain rare earths or critical minerals within their individual basins to help develop the infrastructure that will be needed to develop a supply chain in their area, to look at their workforce currently, what, they're, what they have available, what, what kind of needs would be available, what kind of technology um, will work to extract the material that is found within those basins, and then to have these technology innovation centers where they will work to develop with with their industry partners, they'll develop the new technology that's needed to realize the full supply chain within their individual basins. And I'm happy to announce today that we just released a request for information that relates to this core CM initiative. And we're seeking information from, from everyone, individuals, state and local governments, tribal governments, for the plan that we have to take this initiative into the future. We'd originally planned on having these coal-based basins, but since then we've, we've realized and wanna enforce the fact that the feedstocks that we need in order to have this domestic supply chain need to go beyond core, um, the coal and coal-based materials. And so we're expanding the regions to cover the entire United States instead of being focused specifically on the coal basins. So um, we want your input if you have it. We have two months, We've, we're taking a new approach on this and providing a template to help make it easy for responses. Um, and I have a link down here at the bottom that announces the new story that was just released a couple hours ago and provides the link to the, um, the request for information. So jumping back to the, the work that we've accomplished thus far, um, and I'm, I'm, really, I'm really only going to highlight one of these because Paul and Aaron are going to highlight the other two. Um, we had, had pilot scale facilities that have, with a step prior to the demonstration facility, um, North Dakota, which I'm going to go into on the next slide, is using Lignite Coal uh, Winter Water Services, which is a much smaller pilot facility than the other three, was using coal ash, and that project has completed. Uh, West Virginia University is using acid mine drainage materials. Uh, University of Kentucky using coal refuse materials, and the University of Kentucky project has also concluded at this point. So just to be fair to highlight everyone, I'm, I'm gonna give this very brief overview of the North Dakota pilot plant, but please, if you have more questions, I can put you in contact with the, the principal investigator for this project and he can do a much better job of, uh, at providing you input as to what is happening than I can in my one slide. So North Dakota is looking at separating mixed rare earth element oxides or mixed rare earth oxides concentrate from lignite coal. They're looking at a scale of about half a US ton per hour as their feed rate. Um, and they are estimating that they will produce five to 10 kilograms of rare earth concentrate per week uh, with a plan to have over 30, 30 to 50 kilograms throughout the entire project. Their input is chunk coal. Um, they're estimating that it's about 60% rare earth on that pre-concentrate basis. And their final purification step as they're refining it um, will occur in a batch wise instead of a continuous system. They're currently doing shakedown testing of their system and are having some um, difficulty with their plate and frame presses, which you can see right in here, but they are working through that and hope to have full operation by the end of June and their future plans are to include multiple low rank coals as their feedstocks instead of just um, the lignite that they're using right now. So we're excited about the opportunities that North Dakota is gonna have when this, when this plant is in operation as well as what they'll be able to do with their feed studies as we head towards that full scale demonstration facility. Hi Jessica, do you mind wrapping up? Okay, yep, 
I would um, be remiss if I didn't also mention that we have an in-house research laboratory that is also doing work in the rare earth and critical mineral space. Um, so just to summarize, we've had challenges. We're going to have challenges. This is a big task that we have ahead of us, but the U.S. is up for it. NETL is up for it. And it's just an opportunity to show the capabilities of the scientists that we have here in the United States. Um, I want to highlight that we had some of our in-house researchers receive um, recognition as a as an R&D 100 award-winning finalist last year, um, give acknowledgement to all of the projects we've had in the past that have supported and, and built this program from what it is over the last eight years. And, um, and with that, I will go ahead and conclude. Hey, thank you, Jessica. Now it's time for Paul. Paul, I think you might be muted. All right. How's this? Yes. Better, thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so one of our objectives in this project is to take advantage as much as possible of, of existing knowledge and uh, not only from other academics, but also from the private sector in terms of uh, goods and services and products that they can provide off the shelf as opposed to starting from scratch at everything. Then the idea is to move to market as quickly as possible. Over on the left, you see our research team, Aaron Noble, who will be speaking next. And we also work with a number of other uh, uh, industry uh, sources. Uh, Tom LaRochelle has a company that uh, does the sort of uh, economic analysis and uh, engineering, advanced engineering design for uh, processing facilities. We also work with Rockwell, Solmax, Montana Resources, and SNF Chemicals. Uh, on the right, you see our, our pilot plant. And this is a 500 gallon per minute acid mine drainage treatment plant that was built with one of our project partners, our West Virginia Department of Environmental Protection. And they, they built this with a special reclamation fund uh, money. But you can see the general uh, attributes. The, uh, we have a lime silo, that's our pH control. And it has two independent uh, liquid feeds that go into uh, a set of clarifiers back in here. And at the far end of the plant at the north end is the, uh, the rare earth recovery unit. And you can see the lay down area for our dewatering process. Uh, yeah, let me go. Next. Do I have control over this, sir? Okay. Oh, I'm running it. Okay. So, uh, acid mine drainage starts with our favorite mineral, pyrite, which is uh, iron sulfide that is uh, extremely reactive in the case of coal, much more so than uh, hydrothermal pyrite that you find in most hard rock deposits. So, it oxidizes almost immediately. I can put a chunk of this stuff on my desk and it will start oxidizing within a week. Uh, with hydrothermal pyrite full school, that does not happen. So it's a very quick process. Environmentally, it can be disastrous. Uh, we have a lot of orange rivers in our part of the world, thanks to acid mine drainage. And what you're seeing there is the ferrohydrite uh, in this reaction. Next. Now, most acid mine drainage treatment ranges from these passive systems. Where we, and they're called passive because there's no power, they're, they're unmanaged. And basically the idea is to get acid mine drainage in contact with something uh, relatively uh, semi-soluble like uh, limestone and knock out as much of the acid load as possible before this stream reaches uh, the waters of the United States. And on the right, you see a, a more typical and more active operation where you have a, a doser. And can you see my uh, cursor, by the way? Okay, no. Anyways, uh, there's a lime doser there that feeds uh, into a, a stream of acid coming down the hill. And you can see that white stuff in the pond. And the, um, <clears throat> that's the uh, sludge, the precipitated uh, iron, aluminum, manganese, um, silicates uh, that form. And they are eventually uh, pumped out. You can see the, uh, they bring in a dredge periodically and pump that sludge into these. There's three um, vertical uh, geotubes. So it's 140 feet long. 20 feet wide, about eight foot uh, tall. Yes, very good. And so they are the passive dewatering uh, operation. So you can just pump into these periodically, let them drain themselves, and then come back and uh, haul away the solids. 
So we we recognize this as a as a, an advantage uh, in our operation. So we don't need plate and frame presses, for example. We don't need uh, manual operations, and so that's our basically our dewatering method. Next, this is the uh, progress of our uh, prog uh, project and our overall research strategy. Uh, I won't go into detail here, but these are all the projects that have been supported by NETL. And I would agree with Jessica, this has been a brilliant program in, term, in terms of moving a brand new concept, first of its kind operations up into uh, pilot scale operations and production in a relatively short period of time. Uh, a lot of external funds have come in, plus uh, we've gotten so far, looks like about 20, $23 million. Next. So the general process, we have AMD coming in on the left. We have our lime silo that has two distribution lines. We have mixer A that brings the pH up to about four and a half. That knocks out most of the iron and the aluminum and silica, and that is rejected to in mine disposal. These sites are already permitted to handle this material. It's uh, Rikra subtitle D, non hazardous. Now you can use it as a soil amendment if you want. So this stuff stays on site. Uh, and then the overflow from that clarifier or treatment uh, unit goes over to the second mixer where we bring the pH up on that water to about eight and a half. That brings out the, uh, the critical minerals like cobalt and the rare earths all come out in that, what we call PC or pre-concentrate. Uh, that then goes into geotubes for dewatering. And then we haul that material, the pre-concentrate off to the, the um, uh, usually an acid leaching solvent extraction process, and that makes a uh, rare earth oxide. So on the right, this is another interesting thing about acid mine drainage, and that's pretty much my specialty in life over the last 15 years. So uh, the thing that surprised me was that all of it looks about the same, uh, whether it's from uh, Northern Appalachian coal, Southern Appalachian coal, one seam or another, uh, copper mines versus coal mines, you pretty much get this distribution, which is about 45% heavy rare earths, which are much more valuable by and large than the light rare earths. And we still have about 15 to 16% neodymium, which is a critical uh, light rare earth. So that distribution is pretty consistent. Next. And so here's, here's how the, the stuff looks. And when we uh, bring the pH up to 8.5, we get on the left that basically a tenth, one percent, a tenth of a percent solids. Uh, obviously, there's a great deal of water in that stuff. And through the geotubes, we can dewater that all the way up to 85% solids. We like to stick at a lower level uh, just because it's a quicker turnaround. And then we turn, we acid, we dissolve that in acid, and then that gives us a pregnant leach solution or PLS. Um, this stuff tends to be a little green color. We think that's probably manganese plus six or some oddball oxidation state of manganese. And then we take that and precipitate it and we get our mixed rare earth oxides and we've hit uh, Purities up in the 90 to 99% range. Next. The, each one of these uh, acid mine drainage treatment points is relatively small in the grand scheme of things when you look at a national supply chain requirement. So we're looking at a distributed uh, supply chain. And uh, we've we worked with EPA Superfund and a lot of our friends uh, in the Western Hard Rock Mines. I was just out in Butte, Montana, which is E up in the middle of that slide yeah, last week. And we're putting in a uh, recovery facility there. And that will make a pre-concentrate. And as, as I mentioned, that pre-concentrate is expected to have very consistent properties uh, relative to all the other concentrates that we'll be bringing in just because of the nature of acid mine drainage. And so we want to bring those in from these distributed sources into a central refinery. And at the central refinery, then we'll, we'll make our market ready products. Next. This is what we think we can we can recover. Uh, you'll, you'll notice that the um, measured hard rock sites, in this case, the end value is six, whereas coal is 323. Uh, one, one of the requirements by DOE was to make sure that we didn't, that, that coal supplied half of the feedstock in this particular analysis. So we, we, we could have thrown a lot more hard rock, but we st stuck at six in order to get the 50-50 uh, ratio under control. If we, we are looking at getting um, not only the rare earths, and we have very consistent recovery and very high rates of recovery, uh, but also um, cobalt, manganese, zinc, uh, nickel, and, and lithium are all part of our, our mix. This just gives you some idea on the uh, total yield, what kind of tonnage we can expect per year. Now, almost 4,000 if we just bring in the rare earths, cobalt, and manganese. Next. Or in terms of rare earths, maybe a, a, a 
ton per day. This is what the United States needs. It's not like a bulk commodity that we're normally used to working with, like limestone, coal, iron ore. Um, the total defense requirement is estimated by the USGS to be about 1,200 tons uh, per year. And the total market consumption of the United States is about 25,000. And a lot of that comes in as finished products from, you know, where? China. Next. Yeah, I was mentioning the uh, similarity in distributions of rare earths. Concentrations from one source to another change a great deal based on a lot of factors, but the, the distribution of the rare earths themselves, and I got coal on the left, and that's an average of about 144 sites, and that's maybe four or five copper mine AMD sites on the right. Uh, if you can see a difference between those two distributions, <laughs> let me know, because as far as I'm concerned, they're about the same. And the important thing there is that this means you can bring in a lot of uh, materials from a lot of sources to a central refinery and not have to completely change the configurations or recircuit for every type of acid mine drainage you bring in. We think it's it will wind up being a fairly consistent and homogenous feedstock, particularly in the, in the processing sense. Next. <clears throat> so here's the inside of our uh, pilot operation. Again, 500 GPM unit. On the left, you see the Bottom of the uh, this lime silos, you have two independent feeds, and that gives us redundancy. And again, this part of the building is operated by our DEP, uh, outstanding people in the special reclamation program, and also we work with the uh, abandoned mine land program at, at DEP. First rate engineers, uh, very competent, uh, very sharp people. And over on the right, you see the, um, the we have three uh, parallel uh, rectangular clarifiers. Uh, the blue stuff are tube settlers, which was another uh, DEP uh, uh, innovation that helps the settling in uh, efficiency uh, process. So we we set these from to, to get the uh, right right uh, concentrations of materials out, and that goes to our feed next. And this is our early production, uh, about a cubic meter of uh, preconcentrate. From our operation again, that that then goes into a geotube and it comes out of cake. Next, there's the inside of the, the facility, and this is the kind of granulation on the right you see that coming out of our our, our uh, geotubes. Next, and some of our early results of uh, the first light rare earth or LREO that we produced at the um, at the pilot plant site it came in at something like 34 or sorry 94 percent uh, total rare earths and you can see the distribution on the left and this is just a light circuit uh, we've we've built a, a new kind of uh, solvent extraction process that separates a light and a heavy stream and this is just the light part of it that you're up to between praseodymium and neodymium the uh, magnets are almost 45 percent next and this is our value proposition for the uh, materials that uh, contain value. And this is something that Aaron put together, uh, about a hundred, uh, sorry, almost $2,000 uh, per, per ton in contained value. And that does not count, by the way, uh, the, the transport and uh, uh, processing costs. So that all subtracts out of that. But you can see the different kind of products that we were anticipating making at the uh, site. Next, and about a third of our value comes from non-rare earths in this case. We also wanted to, Combine this with, in order to gather uh, lots of small sources of AMD, particularly in the coal area, into big sources, we are looking at watershed level recovery. Next. And this is where a, a regulatory uh, Im improvement would be very helpful. And we're able to take lots of sources from abandoned mines as well as uh, bond forfeiture sites to a central treatment plant. This is the Muddy Creek operation. And DEP now wants us to look at taking this and converting it into a rare earth recovery unit as well. And so, uh, this technology, by the way, is under US patent, upper right. So it's, uh, it is protected in not only the United States, but we have international patents as well. Next. So we, we've looked at this and compared uh, point source discharges uh, for treatment versus uh, centralized treatment on the right. Next. And we find typically in cleaning up a watershed that maybe 90% of the total acid load getting into a stream is from abandoned mines, which are pre-law, pre-regulatory. And so treating the, the point source discharges almost never results in significant stream recovery. Next. But when we tried uh, this on, a, on the watershed scale, uh, we were able to recover 19 
miles of stream that had been dead previously, and it costs less money to do it this way rather than using point sources for treatment points. Next. And that's it. Okay, thank you, Paul. Now let's go to Aaron. All right. Um, thank you, Commissioner Lane, and uh, thank you all for attending and, and um, allowing me to speak at this webinar. Um, I know we have just a little bit of time left, so I'll move through some of this quickly, but there are a couple of points I'd like to emphasize. So uh, first of all, today, um, I'll point out that I'm not Rick Honaker. So Rick Honaker was scheduled to give this presentation. He's a professor at University of Kentucky and the principal investigator for the project whose title you see on the screen right now. Uh, I collaborate with Rick and I collaborate with Paul quite a bit. And so uh, we thought it would be very fitting for me just to fill in today since Rick's unavailable. Um, if you can go to the next slide. Um, I want to use this cartoon to paint a picture of what we're trying to do in this project, and I think more broadly in um, in the NETL program, at least my perception of, of what we're trying to do. And I'll move quickly through the other slides, but these first two, are, if you take nothing else away, I think, I think these slides paint, paint a pretty good picture. If you look at the traditional way we derive value from mine to coal, it looks a lot like this. And then there are some things I've left out intentionally and, and kind of some nuance here. But we start with a coal mine underground or surface. We take raw material, usually, especially in, in Appalachia, to some beneficiation component where we separate out the mineral from the combustible matter. The combustible matter gets sent to a power station, and, uh, and then that's how we derive value. So this is the traditional, traditional value chain. And in my mind, I contrast this to the petroleum industry, where they are exceptionally well optimized to squeeze every drop of value from a barrel of crude. And why don't we do this in the coal industry? So if you can go to the next slide, this was kind of my vision for what the value chain of the future might look like. And there's a whole lot going on here, and I hope you have a time, uh, a chance to review this. But kind of each additional thing, you know, the things that were added from the first slide to the second slide, um, NETL has a project addressing just about every single one of those. And I've been fortunate to been, be on a couple of those projects. And uh, but looking at some of this, you can see, you know, we still start with the coal mine, but we have things like uh, like environmental issues, the orange line coming down, acid mine drainage, which is what Paul talked about. Uh, traditionally, acid mine drainage isn't even pictured on the value chain because we don't think about it as a value, but we're trying to reimagine it and say, hey, is there value to be had? Can we extract it? And I think Paul's doing a very exceptional job and our team there is showing that that can be done. Um, we also look at this this refuse impoundment. What can we do with refuse? Uh, you know, you take the coal to the uh, to the beneficiation, and it's not just conventional beneficiation, beneficiation, beneficiation now, but I changed it to advanced beneficiation. And there can we separate out carbon products that you derive value from that goes to the right. So we still have a bulk going to power generation, but then you also have maybe premium premium quality uh, carbon going to a coal refining plant where you can make things like carbon foam or uh, carbon graphene or carbon graphite, like high, you know, high value uses of, of carbon. Um, and then down the bottom of the advanced beneficiation, you have this mineral component. So you've done the work of mining the carbon in the mineral. So why not try to squeeze the value out of the mineral to the extent that it makes sense? And really that arrow coming down out of the advanced beneficiation part of this graphic is the nature of the project that I'm discussing. That's what we've evaluated in this project uh, with Dr. Honaker and the University of Kentucky, is how do we take coal refuse and then perhaps derive rare earth elements, uh, critical minerals, and other elements of value out of that. You can go to the next slide. Um, Here's our project objectives. So uh, as we stated, we're, we're trying to demonstrate um, relatively uh, large, we call it a large pilot scale production of high purity rare earth oxides of at least 90% grade, uh, primarily from coal refuse sources using various technologies. And then we've got some additional language there that you can read through in terms of supplemental objectives in our project. You can go to the next slide. Uh, this is obviously not something we, we do alone, we do by ourselves, but uh, we have a really great team that we work with. So you can see the academic contributors there on the left. Um, I had to throw in Dr. Honaker, he's, he's at the top, um, and then Josh Werner at University of Kentucky, um, Wing, uh, Wing Kai Zhang, my colleague at Virginia Tech, 
and then Mike Free at University of Utah. And then you can see kind of what our relative areas of expertise are. And my kind of role in this project was systems analysis and techno-economic analysis. So how do we optimally organize our flow sheets and what kind of value do we get out of that? You can see our specific industrial partners on the right, um, Alliance Resource Partners and KRP, which are both um, uh, mine owners and operators, and then Mineral Separation Technologies, which is a technology provider. You can go to the next slide. Um, in this process or in this project, like I said, we looked at coal refuse, and here are three different uh, coal refuse uh, samples that we evaluated. Uh, spent a lot of time working on the Baker seam coal refuse, which is uh, from Alliance's operation in Western Kentucky. It's also called the West Kentucky Number no. Thirteen. You may hear me call call it that throughout the presentation. Um, the middle one, we spent a lot of time early in the project looking at the fire clay. Uh, fire clay is probably the most well-researched coal seam with respect to rear earth content. Just hundreds of papers written on the fire clay seam dating back decades of geochemists noticing the, the rear earth and the, the coal and the coal ash and things like that. So a very well-studied and uh, very um, famous coal seam with respect to rear earth content. And then one we, we fortunately uh, stumbled upon was this lignite material that was very interesting through the um, and processed actually very well. You can go to the next slide. So how do we approach this technically? How do you actually extract rare earths from, uh, from uh, coal refuse? And Jessica showed the example of the cake and pulling the, the sprinkles out of the cake. Um, in, a set, in looking at this in kind of a, a, a very studious manner, there's really three approaches that make sense on how you could go about doing that from coal refuse. Uh, the first one would be letting Mother Nature do, do the work for you. So letting acid mine drainage leach the rare earths in more or less an, a, a, a natural process, which is what Paul presented on. And I put that one at the top because I think it's the best idea. It's an exceptional idea of, uh, of recovering rare earths from acid mine drainage because there's so many benefits with that. Um, if there's not opportunity, though, to do that, what are your other options? And the second two on this list are things we evaluated in this project. One is heap leaching. So very common in the gold and copper industry today, the Western gold and copper operations, if you have a low grade resource, um, you stack everything up into a pile and you, uh, you let it leach out uh, almost like controlled acid mine drainage. And then the third one would be tank leaching where you throw these into a reactor and you leach them very aggressively. Uh, next slide. Um, here's uh, so we did we actually did this in this project, and uh, I think Rick Honaker will get credited for building the first heap leach in the coal fields. And you can see right there, uh, this was a 2000 ton uh, coarse refuse heap leach. They actually had an engineering company come out and design the heap and uh, do all the, uh, the the geotechnical work on that. And um, you can see 65 feet by 65 feet uh, square feet heap, uh, heap area with a 15 foot lift and some of the other um, uh, engineering data there. 3,000 gallon sump, 5,000 gallon storage tank. Uh, not a small operation. So this was actually pretty large. And then they ran this heap for the better part of a year and, and collected uh, leachate from it and then processed the leachate in a pilot plant to produce rear earths. So collected a lot of interesting data, kind of saw these environmental uh, changes throughout the year. Um, really interesting, learned a lot, learned a lot of challenges too, but uh, this was uh, one of the big successes. You can go to the next, next slide. So what happens after you collect the leachate? Um, here's the actual pilot plant that we process it through. And uh, over on the top right, you can see those large tanks. Uh, these are the leaching tanks. So if you're doing tank leaching, you would take your refuse, uh, put it into the tanks, leach the rear earths out, and then it kind of works its way around clockwise from there till you get to about uh, 10 o'clock on this photo is where the final rear earth product would come out. So you kind of start at one o'clock and then you work your way around to nine o'clock. And you can see we ran the pilot plant for about a year and a half, uh, processed several different feedstocks, including the heat bleach material, and then the free, three feedstocks we showed earlier. You can go to the next slide. I think I showed some of these results. Um, so on the left, you can see the kind of transition going from coal refuse, the, the black and gray material, uh, to an oxalate, which is an intermediate product, and then finally to a rare earth oxide product. And the data below that shows some of the results where we created rare earth oxide products as high as 95% purity um, in the West Kentucky number 13, and then routinely above 80 to 90% purity in, in most cases. Um, also, as part of this project, we not only looked at rare earths, but we looked at some non-rare earth um, critical minerals like nickel and cobalt. 
And uh, on the right, you kind of see the flow sheet of what that takes to extract out nickel and cobalt. And uh, this was done a lot by my colleague, Wing, Wing Kai Zhang here at Virginia Tech. And I actually got to see these. He produced these very high uh, purity nickel and cobalt products. So a nickel oxide of 96% purity and a cobalt sulfate of 98% uh, purity, uh, both starting from a, from a coal refuse sample. So we've kind of demonstrated the feasibility of doing all this, doing all this at scale, and really, I think, uh, closing the loop on that cartoon, right? And how do you squeeze all this value out of the coal refuse that you start with? You can go to the next one. So the, 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 I, I think uh, the next slide, please. So those are our, our technical products, right? Those are the high purity products that you can hold in your hand. Uh, but another thing, I, I work at a university and I'd be remiss uh, if I didn't mention this. Um, a What I think is the most significant product of this project was the human capital that we were able to develop and train. And so on here, these are just the people who were at University of Kentucky, students, graduate students, and general labor. And on the next slide are the, uh, the uh, individuals who are trained from Virginia Tech, University of Utah, and the other affiliated, um, affiliated um, um, partners with the project. I think uh, it goes without saying we have a, uh, as we seek to develop this critical mineral industry in the country, uh, we're going to need a workforce, right? And, and in some cases, we have to develop this workforce. And the program funded by NETL has been instrumental and uh, in helping us to do this. And I think hopefully the names on this page uh, uh, shed light on that. Uh, with that, you can go to the next slide, which is my last slide, where uh, you have my contact information and Rick Honaker's information. As I said, my name is Aaron Noble. This has been delightful, and I will conclude my remarks now. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Catherine, do we have time for questions? I think we could uh, do one or two. We we did have a couple of questions come in that um, Jessica and Paul answered, but I think it might be helpful if we read them out to the crowd. So Mary Whitaker says, can rare earth metals be recovered from coal ash that has been stored in landfills or ponds or only from fresh coal ash? Jessica, do you wanna try to answer that uh, in a lightning round? Sure. Um, so if you add enough acid, you can get rare earths and critical minerals from anything. The problem is acid costs money and nobody wants to deal with acid and then you have to clean up the acid afterwards. So the, 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 the simple fact is yes, you can. The challenge and the technical thing we are trying to do is find a way to make it an economic and not an environmental burden as we're trying to do that. Thank you, Jessica. And then um, from Nick DeMarco, we had another question about how much rare earth metals are recovered by an average gallon of drainage. Paul or Aaron? Uh, I'll, I'll field that one. So the concentration changes from zero up to the highest we've seen is uh, maybe four or five milligrams per liter. Now, most acid mine drainage, if the pH is below three and a half, or four, then you're going to be looking at somewhere between 300 micrograms per liter and maybe um, 800 micrograms per liter. Great. All right. Um, with that, Cherilyn, do you wanna close this out? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Jessica, Paul, and Aaron for your time today. And thank you to the DOE Office of Fossil Energy and Carbon Management for supporting the webinar. Early bird registration is now open for the NARUC annual meeting in Austin, Texas from July 16th to the 19th. You can visit the NARUC website to register. We will be sharing presentations from this webinar via email with attendees and the recording will be uploaded to NARUC's YouTube channel. Check NARUC's website for information on other upcoming activities, and please reach out to Kira and Catherine at NARUC with your questions or feedback. So thank you all, and have a nice day. Thank you for the opportunity.